Hello, and welcome to Linux Action News, episode 292, recorded on May 10th, 2023. I'm Chris. And I'm Wes. Hello, Wes. Let's do the news. We start with two sets of security flaws impacting Linux. The first set is from Intel, who has released 38 new security advisories, including one that caught our attention, CVE 2023-28410. This is a vulnerability in the i915 Intel Linux kernel graphics driver, and this flaw could allow for local privilege escalation. Intel describes the nature of the vulnerability as, quote, improper restriction of operations within the bounds of a memory buffer in some Intel i915 graphics drivers for Linux before kernel version 6.2.10 may allow an authenticated user to potentially enable escalation of privilege via local access. Yeah, so the patch did ship in Linux 6.2.10, and the issue was pretty much addressed without very much fanfare. tends to be how these things go, but it it is kind of a critical update for those of us who rely on the Intel Linux graphics stack, and if you're worried about the possibility of a local user obtaining heightened privileges. So, you just got to make sure your distribution has backported that fix for CVE 2023-28410. We'll have a link in the notes for all those additional security advisories by Intel as well. The second vulnerability we need to inform you about this week is a flaw in the NetFilter kernel subsystem. It's known as CVE 2023-32233, but on severity level has yet to be determined. Yeah, we'll see. This is another one of those flaws that allows for an unprivileged user that's local to escalate to root and get complete control over the system. The security issue itself stems from NetFilter's NF tables, which accept invalid updates to the configuration. This vulnerability creates specific scenarios where corrupt batch requests can compromise the internal state of the subsystem. Proof of concept code demonstrating the flaw has already been created, although so far, it seems to have been kept private. But not for much longer. The exploit will be published next Monday, May 15th, 2023, along with complete details about the exploitation techniques. Yeah, so it's probably going to be game on. And according to the researcher, this vulnerability affects multiple releases of the Linux kernel, including the current stable version as we record. However, again, I just as a reminder, don't get too worried because the attacker first has to get local access to exploit this vulnerability. And code to fix this has been submitted upstream. It introduces two new functions that manage the life cycle of anonymous sets in the NF table subsystem. We don't have a time frame for when that fix will get accepted and backported just yet, but don't worry, we'll keep an eye out for updates. We often have the opportunity to cover advancements in Linux gaming, along with technologies and companies that have been driving innovation in this field for the past few years. It's been incredible. However, this week, this week we bring you a story of disappointment. You may have recently come across the news that developers behind the popular game Roblox have started blocking Wine users with a new anti-cheat update. Initially, this only affected certain users, but recently the update has been rolling out to everyone. Liam at Gaming on Linux reached out for an official comment and received a rather disappointing response. Quote, Hi, thanks for your question. I understand your perspective, and as you rightly point out, you deserve a clear, good-faith answer. Unfortunately, the answer is essentially no. Personally, many of us at Roblox would love to support Linux, myself included. However, from a practical standpoint, there's no way for us to justify it. Releasing a client for Linux would require extensive support in terms of QA, customer service, documentation, and more, which becomes significantly more challenging on a fragmented platform. We already release updates weekly on multiple platforms. Adding the time needed to test, debug, and release a Linux client would be costly and would detract from our efforts to improve Roblox on our current platforms. So with the Linux native port completely out of the question, they go on to state that even improving their code base to work better with Wine is not a viable option, saying, quote, even Wine support is difficult due to the presence of anti-cheat. While it would be wonderful to allow Roblox to run on Wine, the number of users who would benefit from it is extremely small compared to our other platforms. Moreover, it wouldn't be worthwhile 
if it made it easier for exploiters to cheat. This line of thinking is not entirely unheard of, of course, but it's starting to feel outdated and a little short-sighted. There might not be users today, but if Roblox were to use Linux to build their own platform for their players, then they could be in control of their own future. Yeah, and of course it's a tiny user base if you make it literally impossible to play. I mean, some of these companies just, they haven't had the realization that Valve had a decade ago. Valve recognized the direction that Windows, Microsoft Store, all these app stores were heading in and realized they needed a neutral platform. Currently, Roblox's fate is in the hands of Apple and Google. Despite a large increase in their user base, the company reported a loss of $0.44 cents per share in the last quarter, and their revenue amounted to $2.23 billion, but their net income was negative $924 million. It's a challenging business model to try to generate profits through these app stores, and I suspect they're just too financially strained to think long term. This isn't a Linux problem, it's a Roblox problem. Canonical has released an optimized version of Ubuntu 2304 for Star 5's Vision 5 II Risk 5 single board computer. This is the second time the companies have partnered. The Vision 5 II Risk 5 single board computer leverages Star 5's JH7110 64 bit system on a chip. At its heart, this SOC features a powerful 64 bit Risk 5 processor running at a clock speed of 1.5 gigahertz. Accompanied by an integrated GPU and 8 gigs of DDR4 RAM. Additionally, it comes equipped with a 40 pin GPIO header two RJ45 gigabit Ethernet ports, an M2 M key slot, and HDMI 2.0 video output. That's an impressive set of specifications and might just be appealing to developers out there. Linode.com slash LAN. Go there to get $100 in 60-day credit and go check out the new exciting news from Linode, now part of Akamai. All the developer-friendly tools, including the cloud manager that's beautiful, the API that's well-documented with libraries for days, and the CLI that I use every single day. All that's still there to help you build, deploy, and scale in the cloud. And now, combined with Akamai's power and global reach, they're expanding their services to offer more cloud computing resources and tools while providing reliable, affordable, and scalable solutions for users and businesses of all sizes. As part of Akamai's global network of offerings, data centers will expand worldwide. Lots of more data centers giving you access to even more resources to help you grow your business and serve your customers, your clients, your friends, yourself, you name it. So why wait? Experience the power of Linode now Akamai. Go to linode.com slash LAN. That's linode.com slash L-A-N to learn how Linode, now Akamai, can help you scale your applications from the cloud to the edge. linode.com slash LAN. And thanks to Collide, collide.com slash LAN. Collide can help Okta users achieve 100% fleet compliance. If a device isn't compliant, the user can't log in to your cloud applications until they fix the problem. The moment Collide's agent detects a problem, it alerts the user and gives them instructions to fix it. If they don't fix the problem within a set time, they're blocked. It's that simple. Collide Solution ensures device compliance as part of authentication, which reduces support tickets and IT frustration while ensuring 100% compliance. Learn more or book a demo at collide.com slash LAN. As we record, the Open Source Summit North America is taking place online and in Vancouver, Canada, in person. The Linux Foundation puts this event on. The foundation describes the summit as, quote, the premier event for open source developers, technologists, and community leaders to collaborate, share information, solve problems, and gain knowledge, furthering open source innovation and ensuring a sustainable open source ecosystem. It's the gathering place for open source code and community contributors. Well, I guess that's certainly true for those in the orbit of the Linux Foundation ecosystem, and there are many of those independent and large companies. Uh, We've gone for many years to just document the event as press, and the Open Source Summit in North America tends to be 
one of my personal favorite events that the Linux Foundation puts on. It's typically the most in my wheelhouse, and I would imagine a lot of the audiences. It's been a pretty good year for the foundation with event attendance and even revenue, but attendance to this event is down a bit, bucking the recent trends as described by executive director Jim Zemlin during his keynote. You know, we've seen uh, rounds of layoffs and sort of company after company uh, and a a lot of uh, cost cutting. I know I've spoken to some folks who really wanted to be here today, but there's travel restrictions at their organization. They couldn't make it in person or virtually instead. But I don't know if it's that open source is counter cyclical to these kind of things, but around the Linux Foundation, and then just in the communities that I talk with day in, day out, we're kind of seeing a reverse trend. We really had our best first quarter ever at the Linux Foundation. You know, for those of you who were in Amsterdam, uh, the KubeCon event was sold out with a several thousand person wait list. Community participation is up across most Linux Foundation projects. Uh, and uh, we're just seeing new projects being created and new organizations who've never participated in open source uh, joining our communities as well. So I am seeing some hope where there's darkness, and I hope that that trend will continue uh, throughout the rest of the year. That's something we can all agree on. As always, companies will make a series of announcements at the event, Amazon's AWS team is among the first, announcing today that they are open-sourcing snapshot fuzzing and policy authorization tools. Yeah, the announcements will range from, well, it hardly matters, to this could have a significant impact. It's, it's also a platform for the Linux Foundation to make their own announcements, as they did with their embedded open-source summit plans. So if you're watching for it this week, you'll see the news trickle out over the next few days. The event wraps up at the end of this week. So, you know, we'll keep an eye on the big stuff and everything else going on in the world of Linux and open source. So don't miss a single episode. Head over to linuxactionnews.com slash subscribe for all the ways to get each and every release. And linuxactionnews.com slash contact for ways to get in touch. If we missed a story, boost in with a new podcast app and tell us what you'd like to hear us cover. We'll be back next week with our take on the latest Linux and open source news. Thanks for joining us. That's all the news for this week. 